Prisoner in a nightmarish teen rehab center. Felon. Law student. Sex abuse victim. Los Angeles resident. Business owner. Are these things experiences or identities? How do we separate the entirety of our person from our experiences, good and bad? That's what we will discuss with my next guest. He spent his teen years in nine different facilities and boot camps around the world, some of which are now closed due to severe child abuse, rape, and torture. He has spent his adult years as a successful business owner and redesigning his identity. Enduring entrepreneur, peace seeker, 31 and the best is yet to come, Rocky Candola. That was amazing. Thank you so much, Meredith. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad that we met. I'm so glad that you reached out to me. And uh, your story, like I said, is you ain't boring, son. You ain't boring. <laughs> <laughs> and I love how I'm just so impressed by how much joy that you have, you know, in your life and how willing you are to face such a really the darkest corners of your personal experiences head on like it, it totally inspires me so if that means anything to you you have inspired me and I know that my listeners will be so inspired by who you are as a person not just your story but who you are now is the inspiring part for sure definitely definitely and that's the goal right just uh, with everything we've been through in our past if we have the opportunity to inspire motivate others uh, using what we've been through it's just that's a blessing in itself it is. And for you, so much of your story centers around these teen rehab centers, rehab with air quotes, that were really abuse in the name of treatment, um, especially the WWASP ones. Um, I'm sure as you know, your story unfolds, people will want to know this. So we'll just like start with this question. What was it that caused your parents to decide that you needed to go there? Because obviously they didn't know that it was bad. So what was the uh, motivating factor there? Definitely, definitely. So um, my parents were like kind of traditional Indian uh, parents growing up, and they wanted their kids to stay home, to study, to be, you know, head first into the books. And which, you know, I was a very smart kid growing up. I always had good grades, but I always talked back to my teachers and I always wanted to be, and my parents, and I wanted to be out and about. And I, wanted, I didn't want to stay inside. I wanted to, to go play tennis, to go run around the neighborhood, to play hide and go seek. <clears throat> and my parents really didn't like these things. They really wanted me to at home studying and the more, the older I got, you know, the more I wanted to do and the, the less they wanted me to do. Um, so, you know, at an early age, my dad taught me how to drive, you know, the family at 11 years old, I think 12, I was, I looked like a 15 or 16 year old. So he kind of, you know, was like, okay, let me give him a shot. Um, and that quickly led into me sneaking his car out at night in the middle of the night. I would, <laughs> yeah, I'd put it neutral, roll it down the driveway and then just go for a joy ride or Taco Bell and crystals and pick up friends and get food. And one of those nights, unfortunately, I was pulled over by the police in my local small hometown. Um, and the police knew my parents, actually, so they called them. Um, and instead of going to tennis camp in, in Louisiana the next day, the Nike tennis camps, I was actually headed off towards my first, you know, quote unquote, rehab facility in Ensenada, Mexico, Baja, California, called Casa by the Sea by the Worldwide Association of Specialty Programs. And that was the, the beginning of, you know, a uh, six year journey between boot camps and schools and military schools and boarding schools, uh, starting at around 11, 12 years old. And for, I don't think people know what these centers are. I had to look it up. Um, and so can you describe, paint the scene for what those WWASP centers look like, or at least the one in Mexico and, and kind of what your, the normal treatment is there? Got it. So these are global for-profit businesses that operate, um, you know, all across the world. Um, and they have a, a variety of different legal factors and manipulations that they kind of put into their marketing plans um, in order to entice families who have troubled teens or troubled families uh, to be able to get their family back and get their kids back and save their lives. Um, they market to parents, you know, saying, you know, they're the best doctors, the best food, the best care, the best education. Um, none of which could be farther from the truth. All of it is, is basically outright lie. Um, there's no, you know, set studying there. There's no counselor beyond, you know, once a month here and there meeting if you're acting up type of thing. Uh, and the counselors that they do bring in are, are basic, just uh, people looking to diagnose kids with, you know, the, the DSM tests and, and things like that. Um, the structure of the schools is, is very intense. It's, it's very brainwashing oriented, very, uh, abuse as far as, you know, verbal as well as physical and obviously sexual, all the whole gamut, basically. 
Um, when you first walk in these facilities, if you're escorted by an escort, which I was escorted later in life, where you get kidnapped in the middle of the night, your hands cuffed, your ankles cuffed, and you get escorted across the country to one of these schools, um, you know, you're already kind of in a trauma shock mode as soon as you get woken up in the middle of the night. Uh, my first time I was brought with my parents, my mom actually, who flew into San Diego, then drove me down. Um, as soon as you leave, you know, the site of your mom, which for me, you know, I actually told you before we started, I actually got to go back to the school and see that this weekend. Um, there's one room where you're with your family. And then as soon as you walk past the door, it's like the lights change, the lights go darker, the halls get dirty. They start cursing at you, screaming at you, pushing you, grabbing you, cutting your hair off, taking your clothes off, telling you that you won't be leaving anytime soon, that you don't need any of your things and that you won't be talk talking to anybody. So get used to it. Um, you know, your first 10 days you're sleeping in a hallway um, all night long. You hear kids screaming and crying from the various punishment rooms, from their bedrooms, from all different kind of areas in the facility. Um, throughout the night, you're woken up at two o'clock or four o'clock in the morning to go outside in the cold and the rain and count down um, any kind of looking out of line, standing up or sitting down without permission. Um, talking without permission is dealt with very strictly, um, you know, from physical all the way to uh, punishments that, you know, are made to kind of break a person, which is sitting on the last four inches of the chair um, and, you know, listening to audio tapes and writing it down all day long um, until the next level of punishment. Uh, where if you mess up in there, you get put in a room, hands uh, and feet tied behind your back, stomach on the ground, chin on the ground, facing a wall with possibly a guy sitting on top of you for one, two, three, four, five, even longer days than that, depending on how bad they want to punish you. Um, schooling there is just done by reading a textbook and taking a test at the end of the chapter. Um, the entire day is regimented and strict. You know, you don't get any communication with your peers, nor with the outside world. Um, any kind of, like I said before, any kind of like variance from the rules as far as looking out of line, sitting up or standing down without permission um, is dealt with very strict. Uh, if you want to go to the restroom, there's only one four hour break. Every four hours you can go. If you want to go before that, you have to take what's called a consequence, which is a infraction of the rules, which one consequence, you know, it gets you basically an extra couple of days uh, added onto an indefinite sentence at this place. Uh, what they used to tell us is that you know, I was 12. Uh, when you turn 18, if you don't graduate by the time you're 18, you're going to get $50 and a bus pass, and you're going to get put on the border of Mexico and U.S. and be told to live your life because your parents will never take you back, and they don't want you, and they know you're manipulating them, and they don't they don't want anything to do with you. Oh so it's a very it's a huge mind trip and, and brainwash game for especially at that age and mental torture and at a time where you are developing some important developmental milestones, or at least you're you're supposed to. Um, so I can't imagine, you know, how that interrupted your development as a young man. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I read a quote a couple of, maybe a week ago on our, one of our Facebook groups where they were like, you know, um, you don't want to say, make yourself a victim, but if you feel like, you know, the other people around you in your age group did have an advantage, like, you know, like you're not, you know, it's not, not valid because, you know, while they were, you know, you know, worrying about, you know, how to fit in and how to get past school and how to do this and that, like you were basically, at a point where you're just worrying how to survive. And that really resonated with me because I remember back then thinking that like, okay, Rocky, like you're in this now, like you need to not die. You need to make it out of this. You need to somehow figure out what else could be out there in life. Just don't die. Don't give up. Don't give in, you know, try to get past this. And I remember that that was actually a pretty big pattern in my life, you know, moving forward after that, I literally would just look for how to survive, you know, um, for me, learning how to live came much later. Um, after I put myself through other things, you know, at a later age in life was when I realized, okay, you know what, maybe I should shift from just trying to make it and survive survival mode to actually living, you know, life how I want to live and, and creating something beautiful for myself. So it's almost like instead of your identity being, um, you know, I, I'm going to, I'm going to live, like you said, or I'm going to, um, I'm going to do X, Y, or Z, your whole identity was just a mantra to not die survive survive make it through this as good as i could you know i mean i i think i think at that age, i didn't know that i was being mentally abused really mm -hmm. um physically it was kind of obvious sexually it was obvious but mentally i was just like you know these thoughts are in my brain i i can't go crazy i just need to make sure that you know i'm okay enough to be able to get out and it was normal you know even to this day when people tell me like hey i've never heard of these places i had to look it up it, it shocks me because I'm like, wow, like my brain, it was all normal. It was right. like, this is something that, you know, one out of every few kids has to go through. And, 
and that's just what it is. And I think that's why it's more important, so important that we're sharing and talking and, and people, even like Paris Hilton are able to shed light upon these topics now um, because, you know, there's how many kids are out there that just feel like this is normal. This is what they're supposed to go through. This is what life is. And how does that, you know, direct the future of their thoughts and their communities and, and how they act and, and behave in those communities as well? So it's very, very far reaching consequences when you really think about it. When did Paris Hilton talk about it? She just did a documentary called This Is Me um, the last month or so. Um, the documentary is on Netflix now. It's called This Is Me. She went to a school called Provo Canyon in Utah. A uh, very similar regimented program, except it's in the U.S. So the ones outside of the U.S. are thought to be more of the crazier ones because they kind of operate outside of the U.S. laws a little bit anyway. Um, but the ones in the U.S. are still horrible, crazy, and the allegations of abuse and sexual uh, trauma and stuff that the kids face there are equal, if not sometimes greater than the ones that I went through in my, my boot camp. Wow, that's crazy. So how, how did you switch from uh, just, just survive, just survive, just survive. And that was your identity is just like an animal surviving. How did you switch that to now I'm going to live and I'm going to create and do? Well, I kind of took that <clears throat> well into my adult years. I mean, when I, when I was finally released from my last program uh, in, on the border of Canada and New York, um, I, I was ready to live. And when, for me at that age, living meant literally going against every authority figure and every kind of rule of society that there was, which ended up being equaling out to me selling drugs, you know, partying, women, that kind of lifestyle, just 24-7, um, which, you know, is an identity of itself. And it's living in a certain sense, but it's not really, in my opinion now, as I'm grown up, not really, you know, what we can do with our lives as far as I believe that, you know, part of the definition of life thing is being able to share and give. Uh, because you can't really take anything with you when you leave. And it really measured your life. It measures your life based on what you're able to give and share with the world versus what you're able to take in and keep. Um, so, you know, that really didn't change for me until after I was out of prison, after I, you know, wound, went crazy into drugs and alcohol and partying and selling and, and doing drugs um, until one day after prison, um, you know, when I started getting back in the same lifestyle, that something kind of came into me, a, a higher power, an energy, uh, something within myself, you know, that was, that was coming from, you know, a place of greater good just said, hey, Rocky, like, why don't you let all this behind? Why don't you leave this identity that you want to get in credit for yourself? Uh, the circles you have, the girlfriends you have, the, the the dope dealing type of things and just let go of it and, and see what else is out there. And that was, I think, 2012 or 13. Um, and I just left and went to India and left everything I knew behind and started a new life and, and clean living. And you know, that was six or seven years ago. And it's been a heck of a journey up and down, left and right, you know, tears, blood, injuries, uh, off and on with a little bit of drugs as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I finally came to a place now like where I, I am creating my life. I am living how I want to live. I'm, I'm, you know, sharing, I'm doing podcasts like this. I'm working really hard on my business. I'm helping out others in every way I possibly can. I'm, I'm able to take my family and my parents on trips now and, and reconnect with them. And we still argue here and there a little bit and talk about the past, but it's in a very loving and, and, and grown up sense that I honestly never thought was possible. I, I, I told myself that, you know, my parents are just going to pass away. And maybe I will first or whoever does, but this will never get dealt with. And, you know, it's not, I wouldn't say it's like resolve check mark type of thing yet. I think healing and, and that type of growth is more of like a, a dance and like a, a learning process versus just a linear, you know, type of race. Um, so it's still, you know, a constant daily type of thing. Um, but I, 10 years ago, five years ago, even I would have never said that I could be where I am internally, physically, spiritually, emotionally, mentally, anything. Um, and even more important, like not even more important, but equally as important business wise, you know, I, I just thought that who I was was that dope boy party kid that would always have to hustle on doing different things to try to make it make ends meet enough to do what you wanted to do. And I realize now that I'm living, you know, beyond my lot of streams um, as far as all that. Oh, totally. And there's like this pattern of hope throughout your story, you know, because um, you, you just, you were talking about, I love how you say that it's a dance because I feel like that's super accurate when it comes to our uh, mental health, when it comes to recovery from trauma, when it comes to um, even relationships, it's uh -huh. not linear. It's not like, okay, I check marked this, I ticked the box and then I'm moving forward. It's, you know, it's, it's definitely um, wiggles and squiggles on the paper and not like going down the checklist. And so just to kind of make the timeline make sense, 
because you mentioned a couple things there. So after you got out of the center in Mexico, you were back for a while, but then you returned to, you were sent to another boarding school, kidnapped. Um, and there, your main abuser, Jason Finlinson, uh, I would say his name because I've heard you say his name. And so I feel like that's important. And I Googled him and I feel like it's important f- as a side note for other parents who have troubled teens and are looking for solutions. They need these resources to be able that are searchable by name because a lot of these folks and a lot of these facilities, they change their names and that really makes it hard to figure out um, what some genuine options are for true, truly troubled teens that need that. But, but when you got to that other facility, so it went from Mexico, Pascagoula, back up to the New York, Canada border, uh, he's there. And so that must have been just a gut punch to be like your abuser in Mexico is now on the other side of the country staring you down again. What did you think about that helped you hold on for hope for better days during that time? Yeah, so um, so after I got out of Mexico, I went to like three or four different small facilities. Like my pattern in my life became six months home, six months away. So I went to like military schools, Catholic boarding schools, and a public school and a private school in between there. Um, finally, you know, once again, I was uh, in trouble with the law for having alcohol in my car and got sent to the one you're speaking of now. And that was a, a crazy, that was one of the craziest experiences I've ever had. Um, I remember coming home late at night and seeing my dad on the couch and knowing something was wrong. I remember putting a desk in front of my door, putting a knife under my bed, putting my dog in my room and being scared. And I remember waking up at two o'clock in the morning with my ankles cuffed and my hands cuffed, wondering how they got past all the security that I put in there. And cuffed me and I remember seeing my parents eyes through my door peeking like looking at me and I was like I remember being calm because I knew it was going to happen already I remember not freaking out not running to run or anything I was like dang here we go again and the escorts actually told me on the way to uh New York on the on the ride up that uh you know hey um because I was talking about Jason Finlinson they're like oh wow he's running this facility here now oh and I had I was so nervous from the entire inside. I don't think I showed it on the outside. I think at this point I'd been institutionalized enough to understand like how to show my safe self and how to act and how to, yeah. you know, look calm on the outside. Um, but I was going crazy on the inside. I remember when I finally got there at first, he had the nerve to come out and like, has the same, like, Hey boy, like the same little voice he has. Like, dude, like I remember his voice. Like, and I remember for the first, like, maybe a minute or two at the very least, I just wanted to grab a pen, a st- anything I could to just hurt this guy as bad as I could. And, you know, from 12 to 17, I was a big kid. I was pretty much as, as big as I am now, 17. So they knew and I knew, like, you know, that's not what it was when I was a kid anymore. I, I will hurt you. And I really wanted to. Um, and I don't know. I think I think part of my, like, institutional type of thing kicked in. And I was like, okay, Rocky, like, what do you got to do to get out of here? What, you know, what do you have, what do you have to do now? You've worked this program. You've worked five other programs in between. Let's get out of here. And, um, you know, after I kind of like, he talked to me a little bit right in front of the whole group. He wouldn't let me be alone with him. Um, I didn't really see him that much after that because he was an admin at a higher level there. I was like dealing with lower people, lower level, you know, admin people at that time. Um, but, you know, like, yeah, it was, I really wanted just to hurt him. I don't know how to say it better than that. Um, yeah. I, I had a couple other runners with him throughout my time there one time we all there's this kid leaving and we wrote into his journal and like told him you know do good we encouraging you like stay out of here you know listen to your parents and do good when you get home mm-hmm. and he came into our classroom found that journal and took away all of our points and put us like level one zero points um because you know that's what they they they, they're, they don't get paid to get you out of there fast they get paid to keep you in that program um and that was a time when he he actually tried to touch me again and i flipped out um he, I don't know. I don't know if I pushed him or, or what I did, but he basically, I, I let him know that they're not going to just grab me and, and, and kick me right now. And they didn't, I didn't get any physical abuse today. They tried to grab me and this and that. And I pushed him off me. I was able to get him off me. They had two, three guys come in. Once I saw three of them come in, I put my hands up and I was like, don't worry, I'll get on the ground myself. Just don't fucking, sorry. Just don't touch me. <laughs> it's okay. Um, <laughs> and, and that's what it was there. And, you know, I was able to, to, to finagle my way through that program the second time. And I knew what to say. I knew what to do. Um, and it still took me seven, eight months to get out finally. And the time when I got out of there, I was 
finished with high school, I got a fake diploma because this school was incredible. And they were giving out fake diplomas. It's called Academy at Ivy Ridge in New York. Um, but my parents saw that I graduated, got my diploma. I was about maybe six months away from 18 and they decided to go ahead and pull me out of the program. Mm -hmm. I remember Jason Phillinson being at the seminar that day, trying to convince them and me to not pull me out again. And you're going to ruin your life again. And don't do it. Don't do it. And I just told my parents, I was like, I told you guys everything about this person. I told you everything that happened. I think I should leave. I think you should get me out of here, make the decision. And they didn't make it that night. They I had to sleep the whole next day. The next day when the seminar was supposed to be over, I finally realized, I finally told me like, oh, Rocky, you're getting pulled out today. Um, yeah, they do it like that because they don't want you to talk to other kids. They want other kids to know. You're not allowed to trade information with people. So writing in that journal was like a, a run plan consequence because we could have wrote plans for escape, you know, in there. Um, you know, it was a very, very weird vibe and very manipulative type of feeling. And as an adult, I say an adult, but at 17, I was, I felt pretty old um, looking at all this stuff, you know, it broke my heart to see the kids that were there at 12 when I was there at 12 and that I couldn't do anything to get them out. And that I couldn't do, cause there was one kid that was there simply facing a child custody battle with his parents, oh my gosh. you know, and like they left him there. And I was just like, man, like, this is horrible. Like, you know, you like, like I hope you get out soon. And I went back to that school also as an adult and saw it, you know, just how it looked. I, I it wasn't as brave then because I had my now ex-wife with me. I didn't want to get her in trouble. I kind of walked around the board of the school and kind of peeked in, but I didn't, you know, kind of break into school like I did this last weekend in Mexico. Um, but, you know, it's, it's just it, just because it's in the U.S. doesn't mean it's not as manipulative, not as abusive or not as crazy. It was um, it was very crazy. I think I was just at, a, at an older age and a larger, you know, body to be able to deal with it better at that age. But there's kids that are, as we speak right now in these facilities across the world, anywhere from 11 to 17 years of age. Yeah. And a lot of those, um, you said, you know, you adapted, you know, you adapted your behavior, you controlled your reactions. And, um, and then as you alluded to earlier, you later spent some time in prison, not in a rehab camp, but prison, prison on a drug charge. Um, a lot of former felons and, and probably I would dare to say former, kids that were in these rehab centers are challenged to shake off these habits and mindsets and outlooks that they have, that they had to survive. And, and they have trouble like transitioning into, you know, whatever normal is. And do you find that you personally are discovering any outlooks, mannerisms or habits that you had from either the prison camps or the prison itself? Yeah, I mean, for me, the biggest thing is trust. Um, to have your trust like snatched away at that young of age and then have it repeatedly snatched away, um, that's been the hardest thing. I mean, I'm, I'm talking about from my personal relationships to my family to even my business. Um, trust is huge for me. It's so hard for me to, to just, you know, step back and actually trust a person, a process, uh, a system, anything. Um, you know, and the crazy part is like, you know, as you said, from an adult point of view, these prisons, they want you to like shed those old habits, those old ways of thinking, but you know, what do they replace that with? What are they teaching you to replace that with? What are they giving you an option for? And if you give someone that has, you know, survived and, and has not perished because he had these systems and, and these uh, mindsets in place, I had to tell them, you know, don't use them anymore, throw them away and then not give them a, a proper viable alternative and teach that to them and, and talk with them about it is just like saying, hey, you know, throw up your hands, you might die, you might not, but, you know, just try this way. It just doesn't work. You know, you have to really teach someone and, and show them and spend time talking and listening, understanding uh, if you really want to let them let go of those uh, habits and those mind frames and those thoughts. For me, it was just a, a constant battle, you know, until finally I started putting the right information in my ears, listening to podcasts like Wayne Dyer, Ralph Smart, Joe Dispenza, um, you know, Tim Ferriss, people like this that had been through some of it and that, that spoke on it um, to, to really put that in my life where I started understanding, like, you know what, there are different ways to think. There are different habits and systems I can instill within myself that are very positive that will get me to the places I want versus just my mentality of, you know, survive, of, of don't trust, of fight or flight, um, which, you know, was very prevalent. I think in anybody that goes through these type of things, fight or flight is huge. We have these two responses and when we get triggered or scared or 
worried, you know, we, we pick one or the other and, and 100% go with it. Um, and then to slow down and to really understand that there's other options, there's other ways, there's other, you know, mindsets we can instill. Um, it takes a lot of like knowing yourself, calming down, breathing, putting positive information into you, and then having that positive information validated and reaffirmed as you try it and practice it and kind of basically work it out. Um, and, you know, that's the process that eventually leads towards, you know, actually changing your state of mind and your frame of mind and, and doing something different and better with your life. And it, it is a practice and it's an experiment. And it's like, and I just did an episode about this, about what works, um, what worked yesterday might not work today. And it's just like that continual, okay, we're going to get up, we're going to try something new. So it almost seems like, if anything, your experience of getting physically knocked down emotionally, mentally, everything. And then you just, you, you're a get back upper, <laughs> you know, like you get back up and now that's, you know, you, that's become a part of your personal process, which is so incredible. And now you have, um, several successful businesses. How do you stay motivated now with the mental load of trying to work through this trauma and trying to grow a business at the same time? What keeps you going every day? a good question and it's, it's a tough one i mean to to as an adult to not have talked about this as a kid and not really have processed it properly and went through it to, to want to do it now people say like my family like, you're crazy like what are you doing you're doing good now just leave it alone and i i like to think of myself as preparing for the future um i know that this stuff is in me I, I noticed that even as i've been doing well in my life and in my business that certain relationships and certain things will come up and i'll trigger back to those times in the past I don't want to have that anymore. I want to work through it and understand it and learn why I think like that automatically and, and, you know, grow from it. And in my opinion, this is the only way to do it is to face it head on, to understand it, to talk about it, to really dive into it and then share that with others as well, because that's where the real meaning comes out, out of it for me. I really believe everything happens for a reason. And I believe, and I know now that the reason I went through those things is to help share that with other people, to, to share that story, to, to share that experience and that hope. Um, even as a kid from a good family and uh, a, a well-off father that was a physician, um, these things can happen. This trauma, this uh, mental uh, instability, mental abuse, uh, even mental issues, don't don't distinguish between you know socioeconomic classes, races, genders, or anything. Anybody can be hurt and hit by it. And the more we talk about it, the more it's public, the better we can do in, in you know learning about it and shedding light on it. Absolutely. I completely agree. I love that your motivation for prepping for the future or your motivation for keeping going is prepping for the future. I think that's so perfect. So as we wrap up today, I feel like our time has just flown by, but um, what advice would you give to those who are trying to overcome trauma and sift truth from fiction when it comes to their experiences and their identity? Definitely. Um, I would say, firstly, quiet your mind and rid yourself of any distractions around you from music to television to people, um, even to if you're putting garbage in your body, just just give yourself a, a couple weeks of break from all that. You know, feed yourself good, feed yourself positivity in your ears and your eyes, your nose, your mouth and everything. Um, and then start finding someone to talk about it with. If you can't find a person, write it down. That's what I started doing. That's how I'm actually writing my book now is because I started writing it as a journal. And then I realized if I want to share this, I can actually share this in a book form also. Uh, but it's really important to get it off if you get it off your chest. I think many times for, for women, it's a little bit easier. And for men, society tells us, you know, we're not allowed to talk about this stuff. It's, you know, don't say anything, hush, hush. And that's, that's horrible. You know, we should definitely, women and men, all people alike should be able to talk about these things that were heavy on our hearts that, that causes trauma. Um, the second, that's like the first second and the third, I think, you know, face your fears. Um, everything that you talk about, everything you're scared of, once you start doing it, once you, you know, kind of get another end of it, it's really not as scary as you thought it was. Uh, it's just scary leading up to it. Most of these things that we're afraid of, um, once we do them, we realize how small they really are and we, you know, move on to the next step. Um, so yeah, that's my biggest thing is I feel like, you know, is, is disconnecting, ridding yourself of the distractions finding a good person or, or a good book to, to write in and, and talk about these issues, um, facing your fears with it. And then, you know, eventually if you want to follow like my footsteps is, is sharing it, you know, uh, because the more we all have been through this stuff, the more we all share about it, 
the more people grow, the more people learn, the less it happens, you know, in the future, the, the more the younger generation can learn from our experiences versus having to, you know, go down that deep hole themselves and possibly, you know, have a lot of uh, consequences personally from it, as well as for our communities as a whole and the world as a whole from it. That is so good. Rocky, when you do come without come out with that book, it's going to be so good. It's going to be so, so good. I am so grateful that we met and I can't wait to introduce. <laughs> I can't wait for everyone to just in a way meet you. So if they want to follow you on, on social media and keep up with your many, many, many endeavors, um, how can they do that? Um, so my personal blog is rockycandola.com. It's just R-O-C-K-Y-K-A-N-D-O-L-A.com. And um, all my businesses from my rental agency, my tea company, and my hair company, uh, there's links to it all on that website as well. Um, the rental company is Rocky's Rentals. The tea company is Manali Tico. And the hair company is Hair Made in India. Um, so you can Google it. We're on all social media. We're very active. Um, so yeah, come follow us. Uh, the blog's on there where I put all the stories of the past as well on there too. Awesome. Thank you again, my friend. That's a wrap. That was great. Thank you. Thank you.